older men declare war but it is a youth that must fight and die so isn't it the duty of the youth to question or challenge the status quo we see a teen or a young adult as a painful rebel or a boring conformist we as adults see them as a lump of clay that needs to be sculpted as per our tastes and likings if they are hard to sculpt we brand them as outcasts or misfits it is all about us adults isn't it but what are these young adults and teen teens thinking what goes in the process when they dive into a society of generalization standards and preconceived notions the do's and the don'ts prescribed on them forcibly sometimes we are here to discuss this today welcome to mulling over with punima jaydev that's me and i have mrithila kumar my daughter editor in chief of manipal journal the coveted newsletter at the manipal university and an intern at ogilvy and mathen she broke the parental barriers and refused to follow the road more trodden of becoming an engineer or a doctor and took up media and communication or more commonly known as journalism very passionate and individualistic we have had many fights when i have when our views have differed and more times than can I, than i can admit she has made more sense in some of our arguments she is the flag bearer of today's youth who have a disdain to most of the thought process that we 70s kids grew up with so please welcome rudila kumar to the mulling over series to mull over topics like effects of extreme information age we are living in what are the views of youngsters about marriage and how we are influenced by the social media hey mrudu hi welcome to my podcast series you're the first celebrity to join me in my mulling over series and how do you feel about that am i a celebrity you are a celebrity of sorts like i'll be the one who discovered you how about that you are the one who gave birth to me so in a certain way you already did discover me or everybody who gives birth don't discover children you know some day i want to take credit for introducing you to the media world Anyway, enough of myself. The first thought for discussion is: You had a fight of sorts with yourself and proper fight with your parents to choose the path of journalism instead of the road more trodden, the coveted path of science, engineering, and medicine. I remember even in tenth you wanted to do medicine or any biology re- related subject. What made you go rogue? break the parental barriers and pick a field that is uncommon in our circles i was just really bad at math engineering or medicine was not an option you don't me. need math for medicine no you do need you have oh. to write physics physics okay. you need calculus so your calculus career decision second. is only because based on what you're not good at i could write but i couldn't do math so what was the obvious choice taking an option where i could write So I took the media option because I felt like literature would just be too monotonous. So you think you can write? What makes you think that? I'm asking this so that if there is somebody who who writes well, should they take media option? If it's something that interests them, the only reason I can say I can write well is because people told me I can write well. It's not an assumption I made on my own. So yes, if people are telling you you're a great writer, multitudes of people, then yes, you're probably a great writer, and you should do something along those lines. But uh, if you like math, and if you want to take engineering, and you want to be a great writer, and it's there are many roads. And just because you're a good writer doesn't mean you have to take something that would again be conforming to a certain notion. Just like you know, you're an Indian person, you must do engineering or medicine. See, there are a lot of people who have got <coughs> as much scores have as have you. I mean, you got in physics and math, but have still gone and done um, medical or engineering. What was that? Uh, I mean, why did you feel that uh, your scores were not good enough? It wasn't about my scores. It was about the plain, simple fact that I did not want to do engineering because of what it involved. I did not see myself having a happy future doing medicine or engineering, okay. and I can't speak for other people. They will have their own reasons for taking what they took, but I also have my own reasons for not taking what they took. And the reasons are, because the thought of it was just revolting. Revolting? It is a bit of an exaggeration, isn't it? But I'll give it to you. 
since you know there's a saying all passions exaggerate and they are passions because they exaggerate moving on so in some of our conversation and even when we were chatting with your classmates vasu and bon what came across to me was that you people seem to find yourself stressed out and you guys even mentioned that you're burnt out as well for me it is incomprehensible because if i think of what you guys have today in terms of finance or uh, in terms of freedom of expression or in terms of all the facilities and privileges you have it is super abundant compared to what we had what me and my friends had at your age i fail to understand when you say you guys are low or depressed or stressed out or have anxiety all that took to make us happy was a new book and maggie what is it about you guys that you are burnt out in spite of having an encyclopedia to cut and paste from at your fingertips or having more than you need of everything i mean it is a stressful time to live in it's 2021 you yeah, are we are so not having world wars or... we are not but we're always we always seem to be on the very edge and then edge but but okay let me explain i don't think when the when gen x that's basically your generation when they were our age they were as aware of the world as we are we have access of course like you said we have access to so many things now one would think it would make us make us luckier and in a certain sense it does you have access to information that does make you very lucky it makes you more knowledgeable it it opens your mind to ideas much faster than previous generations would have opened their minds to new ideas but at the same time being so hyper aware about things happening around us especially because you know everyone can agree that social media does have a tendency to look at the negatives more than the positive so you don't have access to a lot of the good things happening around the world and quite possibly the number of bad things are also like equal to or maybe more than the number of good things and you're just always constantly hyper aware of that and <clears throat> with that come like a certain set of like expectations like okay you you have to earn this much money or you're going to have a horrible life that's been there forever but then it's it's so much more intense in this generation uh you have to be doing these certain things or you're boring you have to be doing these certain things or you're just a terrible person so things are so much more faster now like everything the new cycle what is popular on social media what song you know becomes most popular or what meme becomes most popular things are always so constantly changing it's hard to keep up it's overwhelming who is holding you at a gun point to be always aware of everything that's happening in the world i know you're a media student but is it necessary really necessary to be always informed about all the negatives that are happening in the world i am a media student but in general it is an expectation perhaps that we've created for ourselves that was supposed to be aware of things like the this idea that okay if you don't know something it should be okay to say listen i don't know enough to have an opinion or to have a comment or to have something to say or do about it the fact that you know saying that is okay is just it's 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 not a normalized thing yet in my generation i'm speaking specifically yeah it's just something that we're learning that it is okay to not know everything are you basically saying that uh, since in my generation we were not born in an information age so we were happy see in our generation some of us like me finished graduation and somehow we happened to be in the boom side of the industry and got into a career at the uh, career at which we were not really trained like the way uh, today's engineering students come out trained and those were the times and days when we did not even have the money to spare for extra training or skilling 
but we sail through working late nights, weekends to get a decent career map. Uh, and that too, all by ourselves, because our parents were not very aware of IT then and would not have, or in some cases could not have invested for our further education or skilling. But you guys don't have these disadvantages, right? I'm not saying that our generation has it worse than your generation. I just think you face different problems and we face different problems. Because uh, you said something, right? Like we, we live in the information age, but I think because you have that kind of access to information, people expect you to know what you're doing by the age of 20, 21. And I think it's all, it's it's cross generational, but in their own ways, all parents expect their children to be like particularly Indians, happy and settled by, I wouldn't say happy, but at least settled by 30. You know, maybe for your generation, that expectation came in the form of marriage and children. For us, it's like, okay, you do your master's, you do your PhD, and then you get this very, very high earning job by 30, and then you get married. And get a rich man. Yeah. Also. <laughs> rich person. Let us <laughs> remove the gender equation out of it. I think there's plenty oh my of... God. That's and that's for another podcast. No, I, no, no, but I get... I still think there's plenty of parents of sons also who are like whatever you want to do you marry a very rich woman so okay. in that sense you yeah, remove the gender out of it because everyone expects their children to get married to someone rich except that is uh, you know not as easy as saying it yeah we have very i guess you would say that we're going through this phase this very socratic phase of questioning everything Okay, since you said Socrates, I should read out this quote. The quote goes like this. Children, they have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in the place of exercise. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents and tyrannize their teachers. Children are now tyrants. You may be thinking that this is a quote from a disgruntled parent or a grandparent, frustrated teacher, or just someone expressing their lack of lack of hope for the new generation. However, this was a quote made by Socrates in 470 BC. The reason I have referenced such a quote is that although it may be 2000 plus years old, it is still relevant today. Every generation since Socrates times thinks that younger generation are lazy, rude, useless, etc. And it is clear that this misconception has always been a misconception. And even Socrates did not know that the youth that followed his times would go on to achieve great things. And what the youth of today need to do is just debunk these misconceptions, which I think every youngster's in some way or the other, we'll keep doing in one way or the other. So in this world where misconceptions and sweeping stereotypes are a commonplace, the responsibility of us adults is not to let young people fall into our repertoire or and allow for a happy and healthy progress of youngsters. But then the duty or the mindset of the youngsters should be to not get put down or let down by these 2000 years old misconceptions that are thrust on them and just be joyful that we are born in this glorious age of information, freedom of expression and abundance. Why I say this is because I was reading an article about depression in teens and young adults and how it is skyrocketing as per some statistics from WHO globally and in India, one in seven teens, one in seven teens experienced mental disorder. Depression, anxiety and behavioral disorders are among the leading causes of illness and disability among youngsters. Suicide is the fourth leading cause of death among teens and young adults. It is alarming and honestly a frustrating trend, don't you think so? Is there things like that, particularly when you talk about uh, real mental health issues that uh, kids face today, it doesn't happen in a vacuum and it's not sudden either. Like I'll give you a various analogy, but I, I think it might fit within this context. So basically a lot of uh, like more conservative people tend to ask, 
oh autism and adhd and this those kind of um, uh, disorders and 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 syndromes um you know every tom dick and harry has it today and you know why is it only increasing in the modern age and why is it not uh, you know why in, in the olden times there's nothing like that like n- n- no concept of autism and all except if you look into history you had that one really odd person who was really quiet who didn't say anything would tend to the sheep but was just like an oddity and basically i would say one thing is that in the past we did not really have the means to define these things right like even if you look at um, child birth people knew that a woman who's just given birth to a child she would feel low and unhappy immediately after the birth today we call it postpartum depression and uh, she would have i mean a a a, pers- a woman who is privileged enough does have the means to deal with it but if you look even 50 years ago you didn't have the con- they knew that there was something that something that would go wrong with the after childbirth that would make a woman feel really low but there was no there was no real technical or proper knowledge to define it there was no terminology there was no name this is reason one so people have always experienced it through the ages except there is no real definition or there is no real uh, understanding of now how to uh, explain what i feel psychology is only a subject that has you know evolved properly in the last 100 years before that I, there was no way for a person to explain how they felt for the most part so that is one thing the second thing is like you said the information age itself right so even if you looked 50 years ago people had their own problems like you can expect a life that's problem free when the most privileged richest person they have their own share of problems but 50 years ago um i would say that all these issues that you're talking about they were not as aggravated or exaggerated because the world was a slower place right like i think uh, when abraham lincoln died the news reached europe in two weeks two weeks later when jfk died it reached europe almost 30 minutes later but today if some prominent person dies you immediately get to know the information and that has a consequences world over right because we live in such a globalized tiny world like metaphorically tiny world something that is happening 1000 miles away affects us right if you look at all the big events covid recessions terrorist attacks some place you would think that okay it's in another continent what's it for me but it, it goes mm. but it it reaches us so much faster and more importantly it starts it, it is currently affecting us also yeah i can relate to that in 2021 during peak covid times the news around hospitals lack of beds oxygen or medicines would be so constant and so terrifying uh, or even some of the global news um about syria or even the killing of george floyd were so gory while they are real news they're happening far away but it does affect us exactly yeah so you have access to infinite amounts of information within a much shorter period of time right and we haven't evolved fast enough to process information like that right the world is changing so fast every minute and expects there's a certain expectation that you keep up with it except for most normal human beings that isn't exactly possible we are still living in the downton abbey times i would biologically but then the yeah. world around us has yeah um i i don't know if you remember but i had this very stupid argument with uh, mr shivkumar and then my father um about how just 150 years ago our sleep cycle was completely different like uh, we would 
sleep immediately as like as soon as it hits night time like as soon as the dark the darkness comes and we would wake up in the middle there to the point that there was even this concept in christianity called uh, you know mid sleep prayers even in islam yeah it's and uh, you would eat a little bit you would pray and then you would go back to sleep and wake up when the sun comes again right but then you had industrialization which meant everything became mass produced people started moving to factories and the the method of working started becoming 9 to 9 12 hour work day 16 hour work day so you can continuously work and then the remaining hours you sleep which is not exactly how our sleep cycle works so it's something that things like that biological things it takes much longer for us to evolutionarily adapt to that but then we are moving so fast from that pace as as a very capitalistic society we are moving so fast that our bodies aren't able to keep up with it especially now like if you think about it 100 years ago we didn't even know what, that there was something smaller than the atom and in a span of 30 years we not only discovered a whole bunch of things inside the atom but also we harnessed all that energy to make such destructive weapons destructive and in a, in the span of 30 years but see yes no but i agree with you so so if you if you look at us our my generation the gen x that you say we have lived those changes of digital era i remember having a phone in my childhood days was uh, it's not like Telephone. a privilege it was like a huge luxury and tata bought a phone to our house and uh, we were like known um, in ten streets of our house that we have a phone from there to now where each of us have our own phones and we can have a video chat a lot has gone by people my age right you know something about gen x people we have gone through all these changes been a part of these changes and let's assume we joined workforce in 1990s those of us who are still in the workforce have seen the workforce change in our lifetime something like we used to have a common email id to communicate to now what we have now and there have been times i think 5 years back or 3 years back when i was having this conversation with couple of my colleagues they were finding it very difficult to cope with it you know the changing technology the changing requirements that you need to still be a part of the workforce in this industry but is it something about gen x you think that we are more resilient none of us uh, are depressed and uh, or what so to take our think. life okay everyone has skeletons in the closet the difference between your generation and my generation is my generation is a little more open about it but that's a problem right your generation's obsession with catharsis you or your generation over analyzes <coughs> over things but we get that thought but how do we move on it's ha- like we throw that uh, somewhere the thought somewhere uh-huh. and move on and finally the thought uh, dissolves and we have other things to you guys See, i would argue that you did all that and then you had children you had us you raised us and we decide like it's that thing no every child decides to do the total opposite of their parents so we decided we're not going to keep quiet we're going to let it all out but so what end i would say that our generation has to think about things at our age the more privileged people within your gener- urbanized working professionals within your generation and didn't have to think about at your time i'm not like saying you didn't have your own set of problems and all but i think this is also one of our problems like we i wouldn't say that uh, we had uh, we did not have problems or had problems we did not think too much about it in the sense like i know a friend was in her final year and uh, she wanted to do a lot of things like she wanted to do her masters and and all that stuff but her parents wanted to get her married probably it is a woman thing also i'm not too sure she got married and she did not mope about it she jumped into her married life with all the zeal she had her two children and uh, then she got herself trained and she went back to work and now she's still working and she's doing good but uh, 
at that time while your generation the way you would make out of it is that girl is forced into marriage by her parents and her parents are cruel and she is uh, it's a sad life for her she she didn't look at it that way she just went into i'm not subscribing to early marriage or anything i'm just stating a problem that my generation had and how they faced with it while your generation will probably write poetry about it maybe i don't know or troll somebody on twitter and get negatively affected no, i don't tell you why that's happening though because all of these stories has made younger people more reluctant to the idea of marriage i don't know if you read malala's essay after she got married like a lot of people were questioning her intent to get married because multiple on multiple occasions she had said marriage might not really be for me because i would feel very constrained by that institution i mean why not just uh, embark on a partnership what is the need for marriage and in order to answer the people who asked her you know you only said this why did you get married she wrote this like really nice essay on vogue about how she was you know always questioning marriage and what an archaic institution it is like the way we think about the conventional notion that is there around marriage today it is derived from a very very patriarchal like if you look at the history of marriage itself it it was never about love and companionship and all of that it was just about okay i have property you have property we need to secure our property and whatever children we have they need to be legitimate uh, inheritors of it that was what marriage was and then in the victorian times it evolved into something more romantic something that is like okay i love this person therefore i shall have a very loving marriage with them now that is a very westernized notion right the uh, that then marriage is about love and companionship like for the last 150 years it has been a very westernized notion in the east however on our side of the world arranged marriage and a tactical marriage i would say is still a very very uh, important fabric of our society it's still a very important thing and often i feel what a lot of women think is that the marriage may benefit the property that is in question may benefit the man but what are they getting out of this like we live in a very lucky place where you know women aren't expected to give up their jobs and their time to just sit at home and have children there is a, a significant part of the world out there where women still have to uh, are expected to like let go of all their dreams sit at home and have and, and take care of the home and take care of the children now malala comes from that kind came from that kind of a world so you would understand her skepticism towards marriage she seen the worst that could be seen but at the same time even she eventually realized that even though marriage is such an archaic institution you could redefine it to mean something else an equal partnership with trust and love so yeah. she hoped for she met her husband she fell in love with the man and she realized that that she could it it's not impossible to redefine what marriage means because that's what people do all the time redefine what things mean to them like nothing is ever permanent right it keeps changing it's very impermanent the meanings of things the the stories behind them everything yeah basically that's why she decided okay i'll marry this man right now that is something she went through very very individually if if i may say so like it's this whole change and realization that you know what i feel i think this aspect of love being in love loving somebody and getting married to them is a scam uh, created by god or whatever whoever creator or the, our hormones just so that we procreate and produce more uh, offspring i still come from a strong that eastern culture that it's an arrangement <coughs> whether you marry for marry thinking it is for love or whether your parents are it is an arrangement that we go through that we need to go through so that our children are protected legally as well as socially that's that's about it i wish i could uh, tell malala that i mean don't uh, don't be fooled by that aspect of love and companionship 
I mean, I, I really want to know See. what you people think about love and companionship. See. So if you, my One question second. is, wait, wait, huh. my question is, if you meet somebody that you love and uh, you want to have he, uh, have that person as your companion, you'll dive into marriage. Yeah. No, no. It depends. I mean, it's a very case to case thing. I don't think there should be a generalization for all relationships. Wait, and you also said one more thing, right? Like marriage is basically an arrangement to ensure that your kids are taken care of or whatever, something like that. Now, that's a very valid way of, but there's two ways that train of thought might evolve. One is the more liberal way where, you know, you... You really open up a marriage to, you sort of broaden the definition of marriage to something that's more than love. Of course, any marriage for it to work, you need to have a certain amount of like trust and some amount of knowledge about the other person. I'll tell you, I'll explain it better. <laughs> Let's say you're running an organization. You need a CEO and you need a COO. The COO has his or her, her own set of responsibilities and so does the CEO. So marriage is like that. One is a CEO, one is a COO. You need to run an organization called the family. And there needs to be that coordination, that partnership, that trust, and there, there must be that honest relationship. It's I mean, but see, it is beyond that. the thing. That is a very 1970s definition of get married, yeah. have kids. But now you know we get married for them. No, now in this more modern age, it's more People get married for all kinds of reasons. Now, the more like friv what? the more frivolous ones are American green cards. Okay. And this is just a very terrible joke. But yeah, green card marriages. Also a very legitimate kind of marriage. Two people gain. Arrangement. Some... That's exactly what I say. An Everything arrangement. is an arrangement. Either for money or for security or for bringing up children. But it's no more as simple as, okay, I'm going to get married, have a bunch of kids, retire and then die. Right? People expect, I wouldn't say expect, but people have definitely broadened in, in their minds, broadened what a marriage means. And now it's not necessarily, you know, something that has children in it, something that includes money in it. It's it's more about the companionship aspect now. Why do you need to get married for for a companion? You can't. You can just live together, right? Some people argue that also, but you know, the I I don't subscribe to either belief. I think everyone should be free to you know either enter or not enter into a marriage as they wish. If you want to get married, get married. If you, you don't want to get married, don't. Uh, strikes me. You know these bridal attires. Or the white bridal suit or uh, the <laughs> mehendi hands with the uh, sabya sachi ghagra is another scam to lure you into marriage. I think everybody I know uh, kids live with that dream that I'm going to wear a beautiful ghagra to my wedding. And yeah, again, that's such a, that's a very, that's a, there's a thought that's put into your head if you think very unconsciously. By Bollywood, by, mostly. By Bollywood and the society around you. Like, uh, Again, I'm saying we live in a very lucky world where people celebrate your career achievements and your non-marriage and children achievements just as much as the marriage ones. But there's still like a big world out there and there are people we know, in fact, who still think that a woman getting married is a much bigger achievement than any advances and leaps she makes in her career, right? So that is why most most young girls grow up thinking okay i'm going to wear this nice bridal outfit and you know people people are more in love with the idea of a wedding that than the actual marriage because you know, the marriage is going to it's not going to be a lala fairy tale forever there's going to be ups and downs and you have to prepare to be enter, like to enter a marriage knowing that there's going to be good times and bad times but most people don't think about that. They just they just think about how great the wedding is going to be. All right. We talked about information age, social media, depression and marriage with a young adult. And I hope some sense could be made out of this on how young minds think about some of the social fabric of our society. That's all from part one of this episode and more to come on this in the future episodes. And as we speak and like always, the youth 
are evolving our society, whether we like it or not, and whether we need it or not. The question to mull over for us adults is, are we ready for the change? Are we capable of accepting the changing world? Or will we spend our old age moping about what should have been? And the question for the youth is, have you found the intersection of your passion and the potential for world shaping positive impact? That's all for now, folks. Thank you for listening in. And as always, look forward to your feedback in the comment section. And we'll be back soon for another episode of The Mulling Over. Thank you.